question of culture and values, but uh, let me explain. So to start off, uh, the first question would be what, what are the three or what are key success factors when you start a company? And actually, for, for every company in general or every startup, not only Paymill, I think it's, it's three things, mainly, beside having luck. <laughs> it's um, finding a relevant problem. And with relevance, I mean uh, relevant market size, uh, solving a relevant problem for your, for your target group, uh, that it's not something nice to have, and that you're actually able to solve it. The second thing is that you're able to hire a team or get a team together, which, is, uh, which helps you to, to make this happen. And, and what's really important is that you have complementary people around you. So you need this uh, Einstein who's having the vision where the company should be in six, 12 months or two years. And, and what's the big vision of this company? Um, you need this um, Bob the Builder who's just getting stuff done and who's basically rolling sleeves up and really just get things done. And uh, the third one is actually like someone like Scrooge McDuck who's having metrics in mind, who's more number driven. And especially when you start to make revenue, as soon as you start to maybe have funding, you, you will see that um, you will spend a lot of money as well. And you need to have uh, the focus on marketing spend, product development spend, and so on. So it's tons of things you just really have to keep in mind. Uh, the third aspect is actually that you need to enable the team to actually execute. So by just having the right people, it doesn't mean that everything works smoothly. So you need to really create this condition where they can do their best. Um, and from my understanding, this to create a great culture within the firm. You could argue now as well that uh, I hire the best people by just uh, paying the best salary and I make them execute by just setting uh, tight deadlines and they will execute because uh, I pay so good salaries. This might work in a very, very short term period, but I don't think that that's sustainable and that's actually the way it should be built. So um, my question is like, does businesses have to be cultivated? And, 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 and what's the value of cultivating a business or creating a culture within a firm? And uh, let's start off with a question like, is this the purpose of business? Like people connect, people have fun working together. This was our Christmas party last year. Uh, or is this the purpose of business? So, I mean, probably it's like, you could argue both, <laughs> but I think it's a combination of both, actually. Uh, what is the purpose of business? And let's have a, well, let's have a look from an economic point of view why, why I believe this way. Um, a very, very simple equation, profit equation. Everyone in business or entrepreneurship, at, at least at some point in his life, should have heard about it. It's like profit minus revenue and costs. Um, when you look deeper into it, profit actually is like units times the price, that's your revenue, uh, minus the sum of your cost, which is fixed and variable. The interesting part now about this equation is uh, what are influencing factors behind this equation. Um, so, and you can argue now probably a lot of impact, different impact factors, and depending on how you argue, there would be different words standing now on the screen. This is just based on what I have experienced over the last couple of years. It's like one thing which is impacting your price is definitely innovation. If you're an innovative company, if you have an innovative product, you can first of all justify your price and uh, you will be maybe able to, to charge a higher price than, than, your, than your competitors because your service, your product is superior. But for being able to, for innovation, your company needs to be innovative. And you have to have innovative people who deliver this innovation. Uh, the second thing is the units. So the amount you produce or the product you bring out. It highly depends on productivity and effectivity. So do the right things in the right way. And again, it's like highly depend on, on the culture you have in your company or how, how your people work for you, that this really like works out and that you pr uh, produce best quality, best service, whatever your business is. And uh, the fourth word, fluctuation, I think is especially for startups extremely important. Um, so fluctuation means basically the rate people leave the company again, fluctuation rate. And uh, especially when you're a young company, you don't have big guidelines, you don't have a lot of documentation, it's in the head of people you're working together with uh, and these people are building with you the knowledge within the firm. 
So if someone leaves the company, this is really costly, and this can really push back your timeline. Um, so all those four things together actually connect to a concept which I would call, or which is called employee engagement. Yeah? Employee engagement is super important. Let's talk a little bit about what it actually is and what are the drivers behind employee engagement. So employee engagement means the relationship of your, do, do your employees or do the colleagues, do, do they have a relationship with each other? Are they attached to the company they work for? Uh, do they feel connected to the company? Or is it just a place they go in the morning to do nine hours of work and then go home? Uh, are they willing to go maybe the extra mile when it's necessary? And let me tell you, especially in startup days, it's, it's sometimes really necessary to go the extra mile. Um, and it's also really important that they are flexible and, and will to assist to, to reach like strat strategic goals and targets. And especially the point what I mentioned before, innovation. Innovation means that, that you innovate within your company, but that also means that people need to change. People need to change the way they work. People need to change things they maybe used to do. So that means they need to be flexible. And that means that they have to adopt to new ways the company is doing business. And this is actually quite a lot you ask from people, especially when you're, the longer you are in business, people get just used to the way they do business. Um, so I would not underestimate the, the ability of people to change and adopt to new things and be innovative. Um, so what are now the drivers behind getting your people engaged with your company and your product? It's leadership. Um, if, if people who are managing the company do not take care about those things, and if they see the workplace as something people go and uh, come and people go, probably people won't feel so attached to, to, to the company. Um, it's about organizational structure. Uh, with organizational structure, I don't mean a big corporate silo like uh, organizational charts with a lot of boxes. Uh, what I mean is like that people know who's responsible for what, that you have responsibilities within your company and uh, that people take on those responsibilities. Third point, processes. Again, I'm not talking about swim lane process charts with boxes and arrows. It's more that people in certain cases just know what to do, especially in a startup that's partially really important. And the last, last but not least, culture. So it's extremely important that you create this culture that actually people can build up a relationship to colleagues, that people are willed to uh, feel themselves attached to the organization, and that they are willed to, to go the extra mile. If you just have a, a, a workplace, for instance, where people don't even have the, the, I don't know, like free room to maybe talk about something else or have a coffee or whatever, or if you don't give them the time for it, people won't build a relationship. So, and now the, the fundamental question actually is still, I mean, I want to make profit with my business, but is it worth investing in employee engagement? And there's a clear answer, yes, to my opinion. And now to give you some answers, because just because I say yes, this won't be probably enough. Um, these numbers are from a KPMG study from 2012. And uh, the first one actually tells that those companies with the highest, with the highest engagement of employees uh, outperform uh, other companies by 20% when it comes to net income. And on the other way around, uh, more than 30%, like companies with the lowest engagement level, they perform 30% less better, uh, good than, than the average. Even more striking, I think, is the second point. Uh, employee, uh, engaged employees are on average like 2.69 days um, uh, not, not going to work because of like, illness or whatever. If you have uh, not engaged employees, it's more than six days. And just for the UK, this means like uh, over 13 billion pounds in economic loss. And also when you have like tight project schedules and when you want to get things done and key resources are missing in your, in your company, it really draws you back and it costs you money. Uh, the next thing is 70% uh, is uh, that 70% of engaged people would actually, do actually know what the needs of customers are. And especially when you are in a startup business, knowing what your customers want is super crucial. And you will change a lot of times on the way of building your company. So by having awareness in the whole team, what's actually important, it's, that's super key. And versus 17% of not engaged employees. Um, another one is 87%, uh, and that ties back to the, to the fluctuation. 
87% of engaged employees are less likely to leave the company, which is very, very good, and also from a cost perspective. And the last point of view, 78% of engaged employees will recommend your product or service to others. Not when, it's, when they are sales agents in any way they shop, but like outside of their private life, because they feel attached to the company and to the people working within the company. Um, so I have talked now about uh, the three key success factors, what's important of building a company. It's people, it's the problem, it's culture. Uh, I talked about why I think it has some economic value uh, that people feel engaged because it has an impact on the profit equation. And we have talked about that actually uh, one of the key drivers for getting your people engaged is culture. So we have used the word culture many times, but what does it actually mean now? And there uh, are a lot of scientific definitions about it. I just want to give you my, my own experience-based definition of it. Um, I think it's about identity. It's about people feeling identity with the place they work, feeling identity with the product, with the strategy, and just don't see the, the company they work for as a place they just go. I think identity is key. Um, I think it's about freedom. And I think this is probably one of the most important points in, in, in my culture definition. It's about not micromanaging people. It's about giving them the freedom to, to reach targets in, in their particular way. And of course, in, in the end, you are responsible for reaching certain goals and targets. But uh, by micromanaging people, you take creativity away and you take passion away. And you lose a lot of potential from, from your colleagues, from the people you work with. So in, it's very difficult in the beginning to kind of like let go a little bit and, and also let, let failure happen and mistakes. But in, in the mid to long term run, I think this is the much better approach than by telling every single step they need to do. The third thing is taking action. So by taking action, I mean people or in a company culture kind of like creates itself by people working together. And already that is a kind of culture. They interact, there's a certain group dynamic. But I think you need to really foster a certain culture you maybe want, a certain behavior you want to have in your company. And that is also really important uh, when, you, when you hire people, that you look for people where you think they really fit to the company culture we have at the moment. Um, and I'll give you some examples what we at Paymill did and are doing. So at a certain point, we found out that actually 90% of the company once in their life played Counter-Strike. So uh, we said, okay, let's do this once per quarter where, where we have pizzas, beers, and we, we play on a Friday until open end uh, Counter-Strike matches against uh, developers, business guys, and then mixed teams and so on. But great fun. Another aspect is like giving everyone the, exp the uh, possibility to experience the community. By that I mean uh, it's, it shouldn't be a privilege of, of, uh, of a view within the company to go to fancy events to see great towns because everyone should be like to get this flavor and this ties back to know what your customers want. And, and in our case, for instance, we, we do B2B, our customers are to great proportion startups. So it's important that developers and others go to events and, and, and get to know their customers. Uh, and that is one of the last events. Uh, we, we moved to a new office because the old one got too small. And that was actually our summer party. And, and, and that's what I meant with like people build a connection to each other. It, it makes work more, uh, less friction, less, less friction in your daily work if people know each other. You know, a lot of things go faster and with uh, maybe also you know certain habits of a certain person better to take. So giving the possibility for people to connect on not a working level is a great thing to do. Um, and what I think is key to make this all work is to, to lift certain principles. And um, princ these principles might change over the time, but... Uh, the current state of our principles is, uh, first of all, obligation to dissent. Uh, what do I mean with obligation to dissent? It's uh, when somebody sees something going wrong within the company, he has to raise his finger and say, hey, this is going wrong. We should do it a different way. It's better for the firm. And at least we have a discussion about it and include uh, another perspective on it. It's absolutely naive to think 
that even though you are maybe one of the founders and you're responsible for a certain area or department in this company, that you always make the best decision. It's, that's absolutely naive to think. Um, the second part is open ears, op open doors, self-explanatory. It uh, means that be available. So uh, if someone wants to talk about something, not push back and like, yeah, I need to answer my emails now. I rather than prefer answering emails in the evening and, and, and take time during the day to, to work with the teams. And uh, the third part is, uh, is mentorship, which is maybe, uh, I thought about it this morning, maybe the wrong word. It's, uh, what I mean is like, uh, try to develop your people. So they start in your company, in, in a startup, with a certain role, with a certain, uh, certain skill set. But most of them are young and they want to learn new stuff. So listen closely what they want to do and in which direction they want to develop. And if you're, if you're able to do that, you are less likely to have a high fluctuation because people grow with your business. So I think this is uh, another important aspect. So um, now I have talked about basically uh, why I think it's, it's good to have a uh, high engagement of your employees and what, I, what for me culture is. And now I want to make the bridge to, to KPIs. So first of all, KPIs means key performance indicators. And, uh, and that's basically certain metrics you define, you want to look at at a daily, weekly, monthly basis to see if everything goes in the right direction. And why is this so important to my opinion? It's so important because um, when, when, when for, for me, one part of culture is give freedom and don't micromanage. So at le but in the end, I still need to manage that everything goes in the right direction. And that's why key performance indicators are really important. Not telling, it, it's, it's like road bumpers on the left and right. You, you, you define like, uh, the path and like, where your employees and colleagues basically can move uh, to reach certain targets and goals. Um, and I want to give you a couple of examples of which are the key metrics we look at at Paymill. Um, one is certainly registrations. So we look at registration. So we have, in the meantime, we have an IT based CRM tool. So Making those reports is very easy nowadays. Uh, half a year ago, it was all manual and all Excel-based, which was a complete nightmare. Uh, Excel is super important for f building a company, but you are happy when you get rid of it, finally. So uh, registrations, we track them on a, on a high-level basis, so it means overall, and then across the 39 countries, we are actually available. And uh, by having that metric, I can clearly see how my online marketing channels are performing, how my PR and event channels are performing. So I don't need to tell our marketing manager all the time what maybe she needs to do or which event she should plan or which event she should go to. Y you see some, some, some hits in, 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 in your registrations if, if you closely track it. The second part is our onboarded, onboarded merchants. That means uh, merchants who are able to process payments, who have all the contracts in place and everything, who are actually able to go live. And by this number, to, to see that on a, on, a, on a weekly basis, I can see basically how my sales funnel performs. So I see people entering the sales funnel and how they convert through the funnel. And if I have a problem in the sales funnel, because actually this number is decreasing at certain funnel steps. So again, I don't need to sit next to my sales agents the whole day. I need to tell them what's the best sales pitch, because that's something they will find out anyway. And Without me telling them, they have started to make a best practice Google Doc and look what, what are the best sales pitches which work best and which don't work. And, you know, people are smart enough to make those things themselves. You just need to make sure that you, you steer the overall, you overall steer it in the right direction. And the last one is closed transaction and closed transaction volume because that's actually where our money comes from. So, uh, and that indicates, okay, do I make the right marketing for the right merchants that we do get the right people? because there are merchants who make a lot of volu processing volume, less processing volume. So this is an indication if, if you basically address the right target groups. And, and by com having those metrics in place, and, and these are of course different to, to, all, like to every business which is like, uh, different from Paymill, but uh, if you have defined the set, you can clearly see if certain areas are developing in the right direction. And you don't need to micromanage and actually, and, and you create, and you, open up a great pool of creativity from your employees. So firm belief of, of our company is uh, that uh, without a culture, you won't make good figures and, and nor great products. And so far, uh, we are really happy with this approach. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Jörg. We'll have some time for the questions from the audience. Thanks, Jörg. Um, how often do you review your KPIs? Is it just, do you do it on the fly or do you do just daily meetings around your KPIs? Or? Uh, in the beginning, hourly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and nowadays we have certain rhythms. So I look every day at the registration and onboarded numbers. And actually, actually at the moment, still on a daily basis. At least me, because I'm responsible for marketing sales. Uh, with a bigger team, we look at it on a weekly basis. Great, thanks. Hi there. Hi. Um, great speech. Thanks very much for Thank that. Thank you very much. A um, bit of a curiosity. Uh, I find myself in a position where I've tried to give engineers a lot of freedom to create and be innovative. And they're pushing back and saying that they want more management. Have you come across that? And do you have any suggestions of how to mitigate against that? It's a very thin path, I agree. Because uh, we also had the case that giving too much freedom ends up that people are confused. And it's, it's too much of decisions they have to make themselves. So it's an iterative process of what we had together with the team to find kind of like the right balance of setting up a roadmap together. And also the, what we did is then to find the right level of where we need to define products. And to be honest, this just was trial and error. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was kind of like we, we started with like very defined, then not defined at all. And now we are back to kind of like... Uh, uh, defining uh, certain aspects, what they, what's hard for them to think about, for business logic, for instance, business use case, um, target group, and all that stuff, and also usability aspect, uh, aspects of, of a product, and um, and the rest is then iteratively developed and reviewed, basically with a team who's developing or defined the product. Th this is the approach we are now steering it. It's I don't say it's perfect yet, but it's it, it's very complex thing, absolutely. Thank you, a bit of a relay. Uh, thanks for the talk. I was just going to say, how do you structure your presence? So I know Burberry's uh, CEO speaks to everyone on Chatter, everyone in the firm, once a week. Do you have a structured approach to presence, just in terms of reinforcing your culture? Uh, okay, or okay, do you just okay. let it fly, really? No, uh, so uh, from, a, from a business governance point of view, we have like regular calls, okay. like uh, with, the, with the local teams in, in London and in Paris like once per week, and if something, I'm, I'm more or less always available via Skype or phone or, or email. Uh, we have other things, for instance, we have a, a quarterly stand where we invite everyone uh, to, to give an update on, on uh, corporate progress, on basically maybe a strategic shift and, uh, and new things we want to try. Uh, we had it in the past, we had it on a weekly basis, uh -huh. And, though, and then we've, uh, we had the feeling and also people told us that that's maybe too much. Right. So we, we are now switching to quarterly. Okay. Uh, let's see if that's maybe too less and we need to go back to monthly. I don't know. But um, so far we have a quarterly stand. Okay. And then we aimed for one big event uh, per, um, per, per half year. So like the summer party. So the next thing is the Christmas party. Yeah. And uh, these are the, and the payment uh, quarterly LAN party what we have. These are the things what we kind of like regularly make. Okay, so everybody knows that's going to happen. And just in terms of UX, do you have any, any structured approach to it or is it just ad hoc? What works best? <laughs> well, <laughs> really tough question, but I wondered how you found it or, or how you've iterated on it really. Let, let's put it that way. We get more and more structured. Uh, and As we have go. one guy who is actually from, from his background, a psychologist. Okay. And... and uh, uh, he is taking, and he's now starting to make those A-B tests and making tests with, with user groups. So we're getting more because we're now starting about the reconception of a website. Yeah. And uh, so now for the, for actually for the, for the new draft, it will be structured. In, okay. in the, uh, first, um, the first draft we had, there was like uh, not enough time and just get it done. Yes. And then we made minor adjustments and now we have starting a conceptual phase where we have uh, user tests user journey tests, okay. A-B tests, then we have a concept, mock-ups, and then we go into implementation. So now it's structured. But okay. This took a year. This took a year. You kind of need data. You can't steer something that's not moving, I guess. So you need data to get moving and yeah, start to yeah. have a process. Yeah. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Are there any more questions? Yeah. Um, do you know about um, Tony Shea's uh, Zappos policy of offering people money to leave as soon as they've started? No. Oh, okay. Well, he, he, he just off when they get new starters at Zappos, he says, oh, you can have $1,000 to leave the company within the first four weeks of working there. And I think, he do, I think he does it so that he gets people who really align themselves with the culture to stick around and people who don't really like it, they just leave. Well, do you have any thoughts on, on what that approach is like? Or would you ever do that? Well, we couldn't afford to, to probably pay that. <laughs> Maybe an Amazon voucher, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm not sure if someone leaves for an Amazon voucher. But um, if you, you know, but I, I agree that it's super key to to kind of like uh, find people who fit your your uh, culture. And and I said drivers of employee engagement are processes. And one process what we what we in the beginning didn't, which was a little bit erratic to be honest, but now is getting like really, I would say professional is our HR process. So we we really have uh, certain things we ask people. Uh, we have certain people. There's always a certain group of people interviewing new candidates, which which was in the beginning always a little bit changing. Like, and uh, I think there we really made a lot of progress to ensure that someone fits the company. I think you uh, you will never have the 100% guarantee that someone fits the culture because you know when you are in a job interview yourself, uh, basically you try to convince the other party that you're the right person. So uh, you will s t tell a lot of things which maybe are not 100% the truth. So, uh, but by ensuring that multiple persons, for instance, talk. And what we look, for instance, what do people a lot uh, next to their work life? I mean, what, what are hobbies are they interested? Do they do some charity stuff or social stuff? Yeah, you, you, you see certain patterns of people, uh, how they maybe react. And, uh, and for instance, in sales, we, we always do some, some, um, some sales calls they need to do. So. Last person came to us, she, she had to sell a handbag to one of our other female sales agents. And there we had two candidates, and the one candidate actually was really like, oh no, I'm not going to do this in an interview, I wasn't prepared for it. And the other person just said, like, yeah, sure, so this, and, and started selling actually. Mm -hmm. And with those kind of like small things, you see how people react and if they more fit or, or don't fit. Hi, thanks for the talk. I uh, just wanted to know, so you have the business part, like uh, the generating money, and you have your culture part. So what would you do with an employee who completely sucks uh, culture-wise, but which, who is extremely productive and stuff like this, or the vice versa? Uh, you, there's always the, the, I would say, the period where you need to develop this person or you try to develop, where you have, like, talks and uh, we didn't have this extreme case uh, but uh, of course uh, some people are outstanding in something I, I see your point and so you need to make it at least uh, acceptable for the rest of the group I think you always maybe have uh, like a couple of outsiders not, not completely outsiders but who are not going to every every time to a party when someone is organizing a birthday party from the company or whatsoever who more keep care about their private life but uh, and Unless it's not a completely, uh, you know, um, interrupting factor in the company, which is destroying kind of like the interaction between others, I think it's not really a problem. Uh, when it's like really, when other people like, get offended by this person, or when other people are don't have uh, don't feel free to talk anymore because they maybe feel uh, scared by this person because this person is always uh, discussing so aggressively, then it's the moment where I think the culture beats the the technical stuff. So as soon as when you interrupt others in, in their way of interacting with the, with the firm or with the, with your, with the colleagues. Okay, thanks. We have one more question. Hi, Jörg. Hi. Uh, just interested to see how you think you'd adapt the culture as you scale. Uh, you've got a really strong culture, but it's really close community. So as you get to much higher employee numbers, how are you going to maintain that closeness? Um, I mean, the first, first test for us was uh, when we had like the small office or small teams in, in, in London and Paris, because they are not part of the daily, you know, work or like part of the daily work, but they don't interact daily with, the, with their other colleagues. So, so what we usually try is that every new person joining us is coming for some time to Munich, at least two weeks. 
The second thing is that we try on the big events to also get the people from our other subsidiaries to Munich. Uh, for the summer party, for instance, UK was present and also Paris was pre present. When it really scales, I think it also de it's, it's uh, uh, like one part is that the, the country manager of, of the respective country is kind of ha has kind of like adopted this culture and is trying to make that in that country happen. So when 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 so when locations get bigger, let's assume we don't have five or six people in UK. We have in a year 20. So then he needs to make sure that this kind of like female office is also creating its culture. It, it can maybe even be a little bit different. I think what you then need to ensure, and I think that's why those principles are so important, because those principles you can apply actually across locations. Yeah, and that, that's something what you can demand from at least managing people. Yeah, um, how then people interact and, and to the level they connect, that's something what you then need to secure on the respective locations, I think. Thank you. We have more questions? I have a rather unusual question. How old are your employees? Because um, I have worked in two companies. In one, I was um, in one there were people around 20 years, 22, 23 years old. Um, none of them were older, and the microclimate there was great. Everyone's laughing, interacting, and now I work in a company where I'm the youngest, and the oldest person is like 60 or so <laughs> years old, and. Uh, the only conversation we have is, you, come over here, I have a question for you. So I have a question. <laughs> How old are your employees? Okay, so the oldest in our company is Kilian. He's one of the managing directors and he's in charge of the product. He's 38. Uh, and and, and ba <laughs> that's the top line of age-wise. Uh, and the youngest, I think, at the moment is 22, 23. So we, d we don't have this big spread so far. And after Keelan, I mean, then is coming myself, who's 31. So actually, we are pretty close together age-wise still. And that's the reason why the microclimate is easier to keep in the company, because uh, of this small age gap. I mean, yes, I think that's one aspect. And I mean, we just started this company a year ago. And we, we could d actually design this company culture the way we wanted, or we, we could try to design it the way. And I think that's always a unique chance you have when you start a business that you have everything free in your hands, what, what you want to do. It just depends on where you set your priorities. I think so age-wise we're close together and for us it was important from basically the very beginning to, to kind of like have a good culture in the company. Anybody else, please? Well, thank you very much, Jörg. Thank you. Thank you for, for your listening and your questions. I would like to let you know that our next talk starts at 5 o'clock, which will be delivered by Nathalie McDermott, the founder of OnRoad Media. Thank you.